The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Ah, that looks good. Oh, didn't see you there. You might be wondering, what is Ben doing outside? He never goes there. Well, you're mostly right. But this weekend, you're wrong. We are here in the UK at the EMF camp, which stands for Electromagnetic Field. Get it? I actually had to arrive before I really, truly got the joke. Anyway, back at the shop before we came, we built some camping-related mods just for this trip. Let's take a look at them in today's episode. Amazing builds, exclusive mods, cutting edge ideas, electronics, engineering, and more. Every week on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show. Ah, it's a beautiful, not completely rainy day here in England. So I'm gonna set up my camp chair. Thanks, gravity. Ah, the wilderness, land of opportunity and danger. If I only had a cold beverage, that would make me feel safer from the elements. Oh, thank you, Allison. I don't know. I mean, it is about three degrees Celsius out here, but I think my soda could be cooler. Maybe if I had a can cooler of some kind that, oh, wow, thanks, Allison. Here is the Peltier-based can cooler that we built back in the shop. How did we build it? Flashback. You can't always rely on ice to keep your stuff cold. So the thought is I would use a Peltier like we did in the can cooler episode years ago. To recap, a Peltier is a device that has two dissimilar metals and when you apply current to it, it causes a transfer of heat. In this case, it will pull heat from this side, making it cold and put the heat onto this side, making it warm. So in order to cool something off, you usually need a heat sink to pull the heat away from it. And I'm basically going to make, reap or remake the can cooler from the past, but I'm probably gonna take one of these and instead of trying to like transfer the um, heat through metal, the idea is we'll use water to do it. So we'll put the Peltier in here, probably put a heat sink on the cold side as well so there's more surface area to pull the heat from. And then it will be sealed from the water and then there'll be an external heat sink that will pull the heat out of the bottle. So you'll always have some water in here and you'll put your beer or soda into it and the water will help transfer the heat out of it. So I'm just gonna do a few experiments here and figure out the best way. And this can of beer is now 13 years old. Uh, we keep it around as kind of a, a joke. It's still sealed. I mean, in theory, you could drink this. Could, not should. I uh, got these bottles at Target. Uh, what I like about them is they, I don't know, they feel pretty firm. I'm thinking you could probably maybe saw the top off here and then attach this to the chair like that. This chair already has a can holder, but it doesn't have active cooling, so that's not good enough. So. It says your bottle for life. Well, I'm about to hack it, so I guess it's life is over. Yes. I'm not exactly sure which unit of measurement they use in England, but we're covered. I'm gonna start by JB welding a heat sink to the cold side. That is what will be in the water. And I'm using a heat sink for that as well because I want as much surface area of the water to touch it as possible. I mean, that's more surface area than a flat plane. Ugh, this stuff does not smell good. I think I mixed up way too much of it. Yes, JB weld, part of a complete breakfast. too horrible. I think it's gonna be a little too deep still for a uh, can and a bottle would work but what if you don't have a bottle? Even then it's gonna swallow most of a bottle. Hmm. I do think I want to put this on the bottom so we'll cut a square in the bottom that is the size of the Peltier and uh, stick it through and seal it with JB Weld and then we can have the heat sink coming off the bottom. Oh wait, we have the, 
the candle bottle. Well, it definitely would submerge most of the bottle. It makes it be a little taller than that because of the heat sink at the bottom. Maybe that's not so bad. There's some foam padding here. If we cut that back a little bit, we could 3D print a lip around this to make it nice, and then there could be a pole coming off of the lip that could plug into this, just like I did with the fans. I think I'll do that. Gonna need some more trimming. Please no, trim tomorrow. Yeah. So I wanna make a seal around this. Your favorite singer slash marine animal. We're never gonna survive unless we get a little crazy. Mary Heidi Klum. Set X Files Black Goop. Whoa, 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 whoa. So the best thing about JB Quick is that it's quick. The worst thing about JB Quick is that it's quick. You get about six minutes. I 3D printed this ring. This is to hold the vessel. So it should snap on here. There we go. And then I'm actually gonna drill some holes into it around the edges as well, uh, just to make sure it doesn't, you know. It's on there pretty good, but I just wanna make sure it stays in put. I guess I could just glue it. Anyway, then this will plug into, or hopefully fit on the chair. I guess we can take a look. Oh yeah, no problem. And there's gonna be a set screw on it to make sure it doesn't move. So I'm gonna need to clean this piece up a bit and sand it, but it looks like it's gonna work. I'll let that cure in the meantime. Let's see if it holds water. Does this argument hold water? I'm risking a lot. If it drips on me, I will have failed. All right, I'm gonna just let it sit for a while, see if any water comes out of it. All right, the ink is intact, so it's not leaking. The next step will be to attach the heat sink to the bottom of it, probably using JB Weld again. That way, the heat will be pulled from the water through the heat sink and away from your drink. It's gonna use more than we could possibly need. <laughs> All right, we'll let that cure. All right, I'm gonna undo my traveling tape here. Power cable. Of course, I had to 3D print it in a color to match the chair. I actually did this with my new CME CNC Orion Delta. There's even a hole already on the chair for the screw to match up to. That way this doesn't tilt around too much. Yeah. Ah, now I can have a nice cold beverage. The tent village, amazing. It goes on for kilometer after kilometer after kilometer. I think, I'm not sure. Well, we're gonna go from here and check out the rest of EMF camp. But we're almost to the part where we get to the main area of the camp, where they have the workshops, demonstrations, speakers, vendors, and the info booth. Blacksmithing and EMF, it's hot. I've seen weirder things. 
lock picking. This tent is filled with retro gaming and a pinball machine that is only six years old. Are you out in the middle of a field and really need to laser cut something now? EMF Camp has you covered. And of course, a queue for the badges. I hear they're gonna be awesome though. The badges, not the queue. And of course, the most important thing at EMF Camp, where to find food, beer, and beverage. I guess beer is a beverage, but you get the point. Don't you hate when you're sitting around the campfire and the smoke blows in your face? I sure do. I wish there was a way to stop that smoke, to get it away from me, to blow it further away from my face. Ah oh, yes, that's right. Why wish when I've already built such a device? The anti-campfire smoke fan detection system. Yes, that's more of it. How did we build this? Check this out. So I found a few parts at the local hardware store. I grabbed a couple of really cheap smoke detectors. I got cheap ones for a couple reasons. One, because they were cheap. Two, they probably don't have any sort of uh, air detection, you know, like, well, this one has a picture of a pot on it, I guess, but hopefully anything will set these off. Uh, it actually, from what I remember, it actually takes a pretty good amount of smoke to set off a smoke alarm, but we'll see. Uh, we're gonna take these apart, look at the sensors, and use those for our project. And then I found these USB powered fans, which is pretty funny. Uh, they can't be too good because, you know, USB only gives you 500 milliamps, but they were cheap. And I thought, you know, there could be one on either side of you blowing smoke away from your face because obviously that's the part that you don't want to get smoke on because you shouldn't breathe it. And being a USB fan, I know they'll work off DC power, whereas any fan around your house would be AC, of course. So yeah, I'm going to start by opening this stuff up and doing some experiments. The USB fan comes with a wall adapter, so great. It says it uses 50 milliamps, which it actually isn't that much at all. It's like one tenth what a USB port can supply. I still wouldn't plug this into my computer. It, I mean, it blows air. I'm gonna hook up to my multimeter and see what current it actually draws, just to be sure. This is why I checked. The fan says 50 milliamps. It's using around 500 milliamps. Now that makes sense, because 50 milliamps, that's like a couple LEDs. So I mean, you could put this into a USB port and probably not destroy your computer. I still wouldn't. But yeah, it's always good to test it with your um, nice fluke multimeter than to trust the label, which is missing a zero. I guess I should take this apart now. <laughs> okay, smoke alarm. Let's, uh, don't need that. Ugh. Why did I do that? <laughs> what did I think was gonna happen? Oh, that's right, the battery goes. I can read. There we go. Test weekly, push and hold the test. Again, why am I doing this? I'm gonna regret it. Ah! That, well, it wasn't as, wasn't as bad as finding a dead mouse inside of something. <laughs> I'm guessing this is what detects the smoke. There are absolutely no screws used in this whatsoever. And why am I surprised? I think I'll take apart this one as well. I bought two slightly different, really cheap smoke detectors. And the idea was whichever one is more appropriate is the one we'll use for the project. Oh, see this one's fancier because it actually has plastic on the back of the packaging instead of just cardboard. 
mean, this this is the one you want to de depend your life on. Ooh, it's got a full ring on the back. Still snaps together. You know, it's probably going to be like the same damn thing inside. <laughs> And it's exactly the same. <clears throat> Open, damn it! There we go. All right, well, they appear to be different, but they aren't. The other smoke detectors we were looking at, I don't think are quite appropriate. Uh, they have the uh, radioactive isotope detector, which is not really that dangerous, but still, it's kind of, you know, strange. So I think I'm gonna use this. This is a photoelectric smoke detector. It still has a chamber, but what it does is it uses um, infrared to detect a break in the light. So if smoke comes into the chamber and blocks the light, it causes the alarm to go off. I think this is probably a better bet for us. And what I'm doing now is finding a signal besides the beep alarm. I was able to find a data sheet for this part. It's an Allegro Systems integrated circuit that is used for smoke detection. This pin here, pin 7, is an I.O. pin. It goes high when there's smoke, low when there isn't. And it doesn't pulse like a piezo, which is really handy. I trace it out to test point 27. So this point should just go high when there's smoke and low when there isn't. This is a great way to drive the fans. I've disconnected the annoying buzzer, but the multimeter should still show something when it goes off. There it goes. I think we can probably just hook this test point up to a Darlington transistor and use that to drive the fans. Here is the final smoke detector circuit. We have a five volt input plug here so that we're not using the battery. The whole thing is going to run off just five volts. According to the data sheet, the integrated circuit will run off five volts just fine, as will the fans. We also have five volts going through these cords here to the fans, and then the grounds from that return to the collector of the TIP-102 Darlington transistor. We're using an NPN transistor because we want to sync the current when we have a high voltage at the base. We have the IO here, and that goes to five volts when it detects smoke. Therefore, five volts will activate the TIP-102, allowing the current to run to the fans. When there's smoke, the fans will turn on. We have a pull down resistor here at the base so that the tip 102 is turned off until the smoke is detected. Let's give it a test. Cool, it's working. Literally cool, there's fans. Let's go over the circuit that I wired for the camping chair. The voltage comes in here and we're gonna use this uh, hobbyist battery. This is meant for a quadcopter. We just had it laying around. Voltage comes in here and it goes into the Peltier, which then is returned here into the MOSFET. The MOSFET is controlled by this 555 PWM circuit. I can give you an example of that now. As I turn the knob to the right, the pulse gets longer, and as I turn it to the left, the pulse gets shorter. We're going to want to start the test for this using a short pulse, because if we turn this completely full on, it'll probably fry the MOSFET. Although that'll give us a good range of what it can handle. Uh, this is a switching five volt power supply right here. So we take the voltage from the battery and put it into that. Then that's where we get the five volts to drive the 555 circuit. And then we also have a plug here, which will give or send five volts to the smoke detector circuit. So basically everything comes from this circuit. And there's an indicator LED. All right, let's give it a test. Now the Peltier says that its resistance is <laughs> 0.08 ohms, which means it could draw a pretty decent amount of current, but we're gonna pulse it. So instead of like, having it on, we're just gonna go pulse, 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 pulse. And hopefully that will allow it to work within the constraints of the battery and more importantly, the MOSFET. But if it doesn't, the MOSFET will let off some magic smoke and we'll know what happened. Okay. Yes, touch things, that's the safest way to do it. <laughs> I could probably turn that up and make the MOSFET fry on camera. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, this is completely unscientific, but I'm going to increase the pulse width until the MOSFET can no longer handle it. It's terrible, I know. Right now I have it at a minimum. Okay. Nope, I know better, I'm not gonna, oh, there it goes. <laughs> Ah, 
Good thing I didn't touch it. Woo! She be cooked. <laughs> the heat pipes are above room temperature, so energy was, or heat was definitely being transferred into them. Yeah, I can feel the warmth. I mean, the idea here basically is the heat is pulled from the water into this heat sink down here, then the air can blow it away. And this is actually some hot water that I microwaved just so there'd be a noticeable difference. But in the case of camping, you would be wanting to just take, you know, regular water and making it colder than the surroundings. Okay, I'm going to check the value of my potentiometer and then wire this circuit so I can't possibly go above that value. At least the batteries didn't explode. Ha 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 I put a slightly larger MOSFET on, an IRL 540, along with the heat sink and some thermal paste. It still gets warm, but it looks like it's stable, at least. I dumped a bunch of hot water that I microwaved in here, just so I could see a really obvious you know, transfer of heat. Yeah. So if my bench is like 79, see it's about 20 degrees warmer right there. Oh yeah, it spikes. The water itself is still pretty warm, but the pelt air is definitely transferring the heat. Obviously you're not gonna put boiling hot water into this, but it shows that it can transfer the heat. So I think I'll add a switch in line with the Peltier. That way you can disable it when you don't need it. But uh, yeah, it seems to be working well enough. MOSFET is hanging in there. Let's install the parts. The fans go right into the posts of the chair. There we go. These screws stop them from going all the way down and they can swivel as well. The modified smoke detector Velcro is on right here. That way it's as close to your head as possible. So the power from the circuit that we built goes into the smoke detector, assuming I plug it in the right port. The power from the circuit that we built goes into the smoke detector here, and then the smoke detector detects the smoke and turns the fans on accordingly. This is our main circuit for everything. We're going to Velcro it to the bottom of the chair and hook up the battery and the Peltier. Battery, circuit. Plug the Peltier in. Plug the battery into the circuit. The light should come on. There we go. Bolt that up. And we're ready to go. Now we need to find some smoke. So we should look for fire. Because the phrase. I'm not gonna stop until I find some smoke. There's a smoky location. Whew, I'm glad that worked. Now I can breathe again. Well, that's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to be back in the States to answer your questions about 3D printers. We'll see you then. The tent village, it seems to go on forever just like episodes of our show, but eventually it'll come to you. It's inevitable, like your guilty heart. <laughs> Don't you hate it when you're camping and you're outside and not in a building? We'll tell you right after we build the anti-wind device, nature. The flowers are still standing. If you sloth me now, you'll take away the biggest part of sloths. Now I can hack up twice the bodies. Okay, I think that's enough goofiness. Luke, I am your father. Doesn't work that great. It's missing a zero. File! It must be Chinese amps. Oh, Fan Master, what shall we do next? What is thy bidding? 
go forth and blow air onto the people. Yes, my master. Ha <laughs> The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. <laughs>